Hello dear friends, it's Carly and welcome or welcome back to the channel, to our little bubble of energy. So glad you're here for today's video on the US Pluto return and we are going to go all the way through it, diving deep into all of the different archetypes of astrology that are included and you can find chapters in the description if you're wanting to jump ahead at any time um, i am going to start though with a bit of reflection personal reflection around these energies because they've been huge for me personally and this channel in general this this bubble of energy that I am attempting to create and hold uh, where we can all come in here and sit and find a deeper sense of all is well. All is well in the world, right? Like well-being is dominant. Everything is always working out for us. It's a time of not just saying those words, but really feeling each and every one of us feeling our way into knowing it personally for ourselves, because there are there are crazy energies at play this us pluto return is just one of them and we're going to get all into it but also uranus is in taurus until 2026 uh, and the north node is now moving through taurus also for the next 18 months so our earth energy as a collective is really getting an overhaul and to see this many changes in this short of a period of time in the earth realm it naturally pushes us into a state of mass uncertainty right like there's there's almost a sense of like the earth dropping out from under our feet our structures coming into question left right and center every single method and practice in our life is now up for reevaluation, and that's an overwhelming amount of change and you know even bigger than the astrology of all of this i personally and this is where you know working with these energies has been very clarifying for me personally as far as what is the point of this channel what is the point of these videos and through <laughs> through preparing this video and the other videos where i'll talk more about us pluto return in preparing these i feel like i have deepened my appreciation for what these videos really are and that is a way for all of us myself included to feel better about what is to feel more grounded and capable of coping with the really scary sensation of uncertainty to cope with that Gra ungrounded feeling of I don't know what's going to happen next I all of this change and uncertainty like anything is fair game and that's somewhat terrifying to a good big chunk of us basically most of us on some level um, uncertainty as humans is is threatening to our survival so it gets our our lizard brain all engaged when we are talking about fear and threats to our survival we slip into a primal mode of protecting ourselves, and that is a lot what we're going to talk about in this video because it's super relevant and for me personally i feel like i've come to a place where i'm realizing a greater purpose around these conversations that i'm facilitating as far as it's not just a lesson in astrology not that there's anything wrong with offering pure astrology information but for me personally, the deeper emotional side of these collective energies is really where I'm drawn. And so that's where I'll be focusing is how do we as a collective do the shadow work that this Pluto return is asking for from us? Most, most, like the vast majority of humans on this planet don't do shadow work on a regular basis. Like, we're more known for numbing and escaping hard emotions than facing them and working with them and learning from them and processing them and transmuting them into medicine and joy and you know 
sources of opening and new potential in our very identity. Like so much is possible when we step into shadow work, but as a global population, it's not mainstream yet. And yet that's what Pluto return wants. Pluto return wants us to do like a deep reassessment of where we are, where we started, where we've gotten to, and how satisfied are we? You know, a lot of us are familiar with Saturn returns and we're going to get into more like the depth of astrology, but that Saturn return that happens at 29, again at 59, like that's a real wake up call personally when you have your Saturn return around like, are you doing what you said you were going to come and do? Like, is it happening? Are you doing it? Are you actively participating in it on a daily basis? And if you're not, there's a tendency for your life to kind of fall apart so that you can like get back on track with what you came to like came here to do, what the whole point of your mission was in the first place. That's what a return is. And that Saturn return happens every 29 years. And so those cycles are 29 years long. And for Pluto, those cycles are 246 years long. So, wow. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is gigantic. This is a gigantic period of reassessment of looking at our shadows as a country and processing the emotions around them and moving forward in a more authentic way where we rebuild something that matches what we know now, what we've learned and the mistakes we've made and the adjustments that we've, we've now incorporated because of the mistakes that we've learned from. We won't remake them because we learned from them. But to learn from mistakes means to face some pretty hard emotions. So that's really where I am in presenting this video as a whole is to hopefully help facilitate a larger conversation of emotional processing around like what this energy is calling forward out of the collective, right? Pluto, as we'll see, is like dredging up some deep, dark things for us to come to terms with. And anytime we're in that realm of healing and processing our shadows, like there's pain to process along with it. So coping skills are how we make our way through this time. And I am a big believer in like the pure abundance of information, resources, learning, knowledge. Um, there's so much free stuff out there. And that's why like throughout this video, I'll be sharing some teachers and some concepts that help me to process as I go through some of the emotional examples that we're going to talk about. Um, basically, I didn't know how to incorporate this. This is kind of my first time trying to marry together the astrology and the shadow work kind of all into one conversation. Um, as they are provoked, I, I believe we'll, we'll stop and have a moment of discussion around that emotion and what processing it, or at least beginning to unpack it and try to unravel it, what that might look like for us as individuals because even though we're talking about this collective energy nothing changes at a collective level it changes at an individual level so even though we're talking about a rebirth of our country's identity it's really a rebirth of a country's worth of individuals identities so it's a couple hundred million rebirths of identities so this is work for each of us on an individual level and I'm hoping to present all of the information, the shadow work pieces and the astrology pieces in a way that is friendly and approachable for anybody, regardless of your background with astrology or shadow work. Um, shadow work is meant to help us feel better, not worse. So that is ultimately my goal is to help us feel better in these energies where some pretty dark emotions are very, very likely to come to the surface. So I will do my best to take us through this conversation. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments around anything, really. I love it when you guys talk to me. Um, but especially this format as far as the shadow work pieces and if they're helpful or if they resonate or any of that. I'm, I'm always open to feedback and hearing how this all lands. I really only ever want to help people feel better, more at ease and confident and capable to face what is 
these videos, they'll never necessarily change what is. The world is still the world, but we can change inside of ourselves and we can handle the world in a more successful way, right? Like think of a surfer riding a wave, like the very first time you try to stand up out there, the wave tackles you and you fall off and snort water up your nose and all of that. By about the thousandth time, you're you know standing on top of the wave and you're riding it and it's exhilarating. So same wave, different you. And that's what life can be like when we're successful in the shadow work space. And so this is just a little bit about my passion for the shadow work side and the reason that I am going to be pausing throughout and incorporating little pockets of that. So without further ado, let's step into it. Okay, so if I'm looking down, that's because I'm using my notes. Uh, remember, there are chapter tabs in the description. In true beginner fashion, I do want to have this first chapter be about what is a return? What does that mean? Because if you're newer to astrology, maybe you're that's where you're at, is I don't even know what that means. So a return is when a planet has gone all the way around the zodiac wheel and is back in the place it was when the thing was born, when the person was born, when in this case the country was born. So everything that exists has a birth date and time and location on the planet. So everything that exists can have a natal chart. So for the US natal chart, there's a couple different um, versions out there as far as which chart is the right chart to use. And I've chosen to use the chart that I'm using. The main reason that I'm using this chart, this particular chart for July 4th, 1776, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at 5.10 p.m. This is when the Declaration of Independence was signed. And you know, when you think about it, like what is birth? right like a country especially there were lots of steps and stages along the way where you could say the country was conceived the country you know was born at what stage do you declare that the country has life and that's why the declaration of independence from britain that is kind of seen as the the birth moment of the country um, so we know the date, we know the location, and the time, historians apparently say it was later in the afternoon, so anywho, they have chosen 5.10 p.m. as the birth time. That is how we come to know the chart for the U.S. as a country. So in this chart, 246 years ago, when they signed the Declaration of Independence, Pluto was at 27 degrees Capricorn, and Pluto is about to be back at 27 degrees of Capricorn for the first time since 1776. So that is a huge cycle, 246 years, uh, that it has taken Pluto to go all the way around the zodiac wheel and come back to 27 degrees of Capricorn where it was when the country was born, meaning this is the US's first Pluto return. Uh, it happens every 246 years. So depending on how long the country has been alive, that's how many times they've gone through this process. As far as the exact date of when this return will be exact, I've seen February 20th, 21st, and 22nd. And again, it seems like it depends on exactly which chart you're using. Also just your location on the planet, plus Pluto is moving so slowly, so the exact return of it being at 27 degrees, 33 minutes, lasts for several hours. There's a couple different dates out there, so I'll give you February 20th through February 22nd. And I'll say that the exact date doesn't matter as much just because it is moving so slowly and really we still have about 18 months of this US Pluto return energy playing out before we'll be moving forward out of the US Pluto return. So more to come on that at the end of the video when we touch on up next after Pluto and Capricorn is Pluto and Aquarius. The last thing I'll say about 
uh, the, the return side of it, just in basics. I've also seen around different astrologers talking about how the first time that the US Pluto return was triggered, so that 27 degrees of Capricorn was when Saturn came through there. Saturn and Jupiter and Pluto were all conjunct um, in the end of Capricorn at the beginning of 2020 in, let's see, in February of 2020. And for most people, the pandemic started in like March of 2020. So we have been very much living out these Pluto return energies for almost two years now. And I personally believe based on what I've studied from other astrologers and my own intuition that to a certain extent, the transformation is kind of only just beginning that in February 2022, when it becomes exact, that that is really like a heating up point. And then we'll have 18 months of the dust settling of whatever those transformations may look like. So at a very high level, uh, when we're talking about Pluto return in Capricorn in the second house, which it happens to be for the US, and remember, we're going to do deep dives into each of these pieces. But essentially, this is a once in a lifetime transit. So, you know, 246 years since this has happened. So it'll be several more generations of people who live with what we do during this rebirth stage they'll live out the cycle of karma that we're starting right now and 246 years from now if the country still exists they'll do it again so that's crazy exciting um, talk about having a big impact on the future um, essentially pluto return is a rebirth of the country's identity and like i talked about in the beginning you know nothing changes at a collective level so these are transformations that are happening on the individual level but it's like so many more and more people are transforming that it is tipping the scales and now we are having this pluto return which is like this exaggeration of what has already been happening and bringing it to the surface bringing it to a head so to speak so that we can face it and deal with it and move on whenever we're talking about pluto it tends to leave a path of destruction in its wake uh, pluto is kind of a destroyer by nature um, but ultimately Pluto is not a bad thing. Like in astrology, I feel like there's a lot of fear around Pluto just in general um, because of that, because it's like the god of hell and we're going to get into all of that. But it's really not bad. It's not scary because nothing that is for you or for your highest good, for the highest good of all, none of that can be destroyed. So the only things that get destroyed are things that are not for your highest good. They are not for the highest good of all those things are eligible for destruction. And again, we're gonna swim deep into what that means, the emotions that that brings up, because even though something's not for your highest good, you can still feel loss about it. You can still feel grief about losing it. So there's a lot of emotions there to process. You know, I know we're here talking about US Pluto return, and that sounds like it's something that's happening to the US, but I, promise you that this is something that ha is happening to the world as a whole this is something that collective consciousness as a whole is going through that the existence and the presence of the u.s in the global economy and culture our presence is very influential for one thing for two, our economy is very influential. Um, we buy a lot of things from a lot of different countries. So if the US all of a sudden like wasn't buying all those things from all those countries, those countries' economies would look very different. The fluctuations of our economy ripple through the world as a whole. So that's just the, the interconnected world that we've built for ourselves as humans. and something something of a theme with Pluto return is kind of like you made your bed now lay in it so we built this and now we get to go through the consequences of what we built and Pluto by nature is destroying the things that are not serving our highest good and making space for things that are going to serve our highest good so it 
again, is not for nothing. It really isn't. And as much as we possibly can stay focused on the good that we are ultimately aiming to create, while as much as necessary processing the hard emotions, the loss, the grief, etc., that arise as we're talking about all this change. So because of our interconnected world and this global economy, that is what gave birth to video two in this series, which is the rebirth of the U.S. economy. And I personally am an economics nerd. Uh, recessions and depressions both are one of my favorite hobbies to study. Um, that started a couple years ago. I had no idea like why all of a sudden I can't stop binge watching documentaries about the 2008 financial crisis, crisis, the Great Depression, the 1987 stock market crash, the 1929 stock market crash, on and on and on with like all these things. And I'm like, why? Why am I, why am I all of a sudden like insatiable? Can't learn enough about these things. And then it comes time to discuss the U.S. Pluto return with all of you and suddenly an in-depth conversation about what caused the 2008 financial crisis is suddenly extremely relevant because Pluto entered Capricorn for a couple months at the beginning of 2008. And that was when the first bank fell. That was when the very first bank, Bear Stearns, nearly went bankrupt. They eventually got bought. Um, and then Pluto went retrograde and went back into Sagittarius for a few months. And by the time it got back to Capricorn again, we were in full-blown financial crisis because the pieces had collapsed. It had all fallen apart. And I personally find that to be maybe the most fascinating story in all of history is like what caused the 2008 financial crisis um, spoiler alert it was the housing bubble but what caused the housing bubble what causes any bubble what is a bubble what 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 the f is a bubble and why do they burst I find it fascinating so in video two I plan to take you through all of the different pieces that came together to create the housing bubble that created the burst of the housing bubble and why that created a global recession as in nearly every economy in the world felt the ripple effects of the US housing market crashing. So I think again I think it's a great story. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. So that's what video two will be about. And I had to do that because otherwise this video would have been five hours long because, oh my gosh, you get me going about recessionary economics and I just can't shut up. And then the third video of this series is intended to proactively allow for, I'm, I'm guessing there will be questions. I'm guessing you all will have reactions and thoughts that I didn't think of and point out wells that we can swim down even further um, to explore all of this yummy contemplation around these energies. So video three will be a comment response video as far as like responding to whatever you guys leave. So by all means, put that down there. And you know, video four, five, six, I don't even know. However many comment response videos I need to make to get us through this 18 month period, that's what we'll do. Um, so even if you're watching this a decent chunk into the future, please continue to leave those comments. Know that I am reading them and watching for patterns around like what would, what information can we spend some time on that seems like it would be valuable for our community as a whole. So here I have a little little ditty that I would like to share with you as far as tools for getting through this time. Uh, I've mentioned her on my channel several times lately. Her name is Tara Brock and she is a certified psychologist and her channel is full of free material that is so good as far as practicing how to be emotionally aware through hard times, how to be with difficult emotions and to really get the message of what's behind those emotions and act from a place of using those emotions again instead of, instead of letting it overrun you and you fighting inside of yourself between you and uncomfortable emotions. And I'm able to describe that state because I lived there for a good long while. So no shame if that's where you are, but Tara Brock is amazing as far as 
working our way into a state where even when there's negative emotion, we're able to still get the hit of the essence of what is it that we're really being shown through this emotional message. So in this particular video, um, it's called Learning to Respond Instead of React. And she does a brilliant depiction of our fear brain and our soothing brain. And basically how our thoughts are always real, but may not be true. So there's like a tendency for us to just automatically believe our thoughts and like take the emotional hit of this, this true thought, even if the thought may not be true or it's embellished or it's over-exaggerated or whatever. She quotes a study that shows the rush of emotions, like the biochemicals that run through our body when we detect danger or threats, that part lasts for roughly 90 seconds. And if it feels like it lasts longer than that in your physical experience, that those are our thoughts that are continuing to fuel the emotional experience, that the emotion itself doesn't last that long, only our thoughts keep it going. And really, I'm adding this tool because anytime we're talking about change, there is always a a certain amount of fear that comes along with that. Even if you're somebody who really appreciates change, there's still unknown. And with that, our fear brain, our survival brain is programmed to detect the unknown and make it certain because that's how we can guarantee ourselves that we're going to be okay and that we're going to survive. So it's totally normal and natural to feel afraid when we start talking about revolutions and rebirths of our society, economy, and country as a whole, let alone at an individual level, like how, you know, what am I even supposed to be doing? Um, We don't yet have the specifics of what's coming in the future, but there are tools for helping ourselves move more easily through this time. This Tara Brock video is a perfect example of one such tool. Her three points that she spends this video reflecting on are one, don't believe your thoughts, two, remember to pause, and three, remember love. And so kind of the same thing as I said before, like this doesn't change what is, this changes us on the inside to be able to better allow those negative emotions or painful emotions to move through us like the sky lets the storm move through the storm doesn't stain the sky the sky doesn't hold on to the storm the storm just is and it just passes through and when it's passed the sky is blue again so it's like that it's like i learning to identify with ourselves as the sky where the emotions are passing through like the clouds like the weather patterns and that we are the sky we are not the weather itself So to start with Capricorn, where this Pluto is having its return, this is where Pluto was at 27 degrees when the country was born. Capricorn in a country's chart is the economy and any system, like that's, that's big, any system in the country, okay? So like top-down structures, that's very Capricorn in nature, like you think about corporations or government in general where like there's a little bit of people with the power at the top and then there's a lot of people at the bottom who have way less power so that would be like a pyramid shaped power structure and that's what Capricorn rules in a country's chart think of all of the different kinds of systems that exist in this country and really all countries I mean it's all basically about the same so there's the government in general. And when I say government, think like, have you ever tried to study how the electoral college works? Have you ever tried to study like how states get, states votes, like individual citizens votes get filtered up through like the state has to all vote the same. And then like that gets moved over here to how many votes they have in the electoral college. And that's all based on pop. Like, have you ever like really tried to track down like how that system works? like how we even elect government officials. Yeah, it's a convoluted one. Our education system. So keep in mind that when we get into stuff like that, or healthcare is another good example, it's not the act of education, it's not the act of healthcare, it's the system 
through which you know education is prioritized for funding or healthcare is mostly private like these are mostly for-profit hospitals how insurance works like in our country as far as co-pays and how high healthcare prices are in general because again the indus- the insurance industry and another one is the financial system so Again, that second video is going to go in depth into the financial system and what were some critical mass flaws that happened back in 2008, where not only did our economy take a hit, but like I said, those ripple effects went out into the global economy. And that basically those issues weren't corrected, like hardly at all. So... I know we can look and in that second video i do have some some research on the consequences that came out of the 2008 financial crisis and what's changed as a result of that yada 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 but let me just say it's a disappointingly small list of information in that category compared to we are essentially still carrying on with the root causes of what caused that financial crisis to begin with and those root causes weren't really ever addressed and again spoiler alert it was predatory lending practices so again that's the system the system has cancer like the system turned predatory on the american public that's what happened that made a housing bubble and then it burst because it just got so extreme it was so huge that like all bubbles burst when they get big enough poof There it goes. There's everything. There's $5 trillion in wealth. Bye-bye. Wave bye-bye to that. It's gone. It evaporated into nothingness because that tells you something about wealth. It evaporated. Where did it go? Is wealth even real? It evaporated. Matter can't be created or destroyed, so where the hell did it go? What do you mean it evaporated? What did it turn to a gas? Where did it go? How did $5 trillion in wealth evaporate? It did as a result of the 2008 financial crisis. To get a little bit deeper into Capricorn, so this is more of that kind of individual perspective as far as this this rebirth of the country's identity is taking place inside of each one of us. So how can we how can we individually participate in these reflections? So Capricorn when I think about Capricorn, the very first words that always come to mind are our great work. Capricorn is an earth sign. It's also a feminine sign because it's an earth sign. So to me, Capricorn is like this energy where we are 100% committed and taking it very seriously that we as a soul came forward to give birth to some great work on this planet. Now, for some people, that is literally the kids that they have and raise and what those children go on to do in their lives. For others, they build companies. For others, they become doctors and they you know, spend their lives taking care of people. On and on and on. There's a million different ways that our great work can play out but that's basically the compass that Capricorn is inside of us is like that is the piece of us that is dedicated to making our great work a reality. Capricorn also encompasses our duties and responsibilities so inside of Capricorn energy there is a sense of unbreakable responsibility. I gave my word I have to do this. I'm obligated to do this because I said I would. There's like an honor and a self-respect inside of Capricorn that like any of the superpowers of any of the signs, I personally think that all of the signs, when you talk about their superpower, it can also very easily become their kryptonite because Capricorn can just as easily flip into this like overly traditional place of respecting authority figures because they're authority figures like on and on and on with this like very traditional hierarchy structure where you buy into the structure and those people at the very top they have power because you believe that they do and all of a sudden Capricorn can get off course where it's applying all of that self-discipline all of that responsibility all of that sense of duty to somebody else's mission 
So the light side of Capricorn is that you are extremely focused and likely to achieve whatever great work you set out to do. And the shadow side of Capricorn is that you're likely to get to a top of the mountain or to a top of a mountain. All right. But will it be the mountain that you said you would climb originally? Or did you get distracted and climb somebody else's mountain? Capricorn also is a side of us where we are accepting of hard work to reach our goal. And again, that can be used uh, to great benefit for our country as far as like, we tend to be a very hardworking population. On the other hand, when misguided, we can work very hard on all the wrong things. We can work very hard to achieve goals that don't really matter or to achieve success at the detriment of other people for our businesses to be successful by ripping off the American public. Like, you know, this is where Capricorn can get sidetracked into materialism. Any earth sign, the the shadow side of earth energy is that you get stuck in the material realm. You get stuck worrying about trying to maximize your physical resources and using those physical resources to measure your success. And in doing that, it gets so exaggerated that eventually the banking industry is a perfect example of this and how does the system turn predatory that that industry was making money off of people taking out mortgages and when all the people who could afford mortgages had taken out their mortgage now there's nobody else there the industry instead of not selling as many mortgages and just waiting for more people to be able to afford them they went around rules They went through loopholes, they found the gray area, and they exploited it to give mortgages to people who couldn't afford them. And that is the system turning predatory. They no longer cared if it was going to work out in the end for the other person. They were now mostly concerned with selling another mortgage. They were were looking at it for their own personal gain instead of the gain of the highest good of all of us, because we are all in this together. So when when that housing system turned predatory on the public, it was the beginning of the end. And they had a good few years of selling houses to people who couldn't afford it, basically. And in 2007, when those adjustable rates began to kick in, um, lots of people could no longer afford their homes. And the consequences of them doing that, of selling those mortgages to people who couldn't afford it, those chickens have to come home to roost. And that is essentially what is happening anytime we're talking about Pluto and Capricorn in general. So like I said, like these, Pluto first stepped into Capricorn in early 2008 and then has been there full time since the end of 2008. So we've been leading up to this for quite some time. And again, we have 18 more months of those chickens coming home to roost and of those those pieces of the system that aren't working coming to light and you think like these last couple years we've had a lot of that we've had a lot of flaws in our systems coming to light where we can see them for what they are we can see the problem that exists and what we choose to do about that or with that information once it happens that's up to each of us individually and we're going to get more into that as we go here So that takes us right into Pluto, where Pluto in a country's chart represents corruption, toxicity, and healing, and the wound the country's evolution is overcoming. Let me say that again. The wound the country's evolution is overcoming. So what does that mean? That means, like, why was the country born in the first place? That's what Pluto means in an individual's chart. When we look at our Pluto placement, both by sign and by house, that is what we want to know. Like, why why was your soul coming back in the first place? What was the point? Pluto can tell us a lot towards that end. So why was the country (laughs) born in the first place? And we know the answer to that. We know that they left Britain for very specific reasons. Tax over taxation and no representation. That was basically their whole tagline. Um, And again, I just have to credit Pam Gregory. She's so amazing. Um, She has a YouTube channel on on YouTube. Um, And 
she is so awesome at hitting on the astrology and the history how those two things go hand in hand so usually when i make uh, historical references you can thank pam gregory for putting those in my mind so yeah the revolutionary war was 1775 to 1783 because there was too much taxation and not enough representation so you're taking all our money with your ridiculously high taxes and you're paying your own lavish lifestyle with our money and then you're making up rules that we have to follow that we don't have a say in we are done with this we are not living this way anymore that was where our country was born was in that conversation of our security is in jeopardy you're taking away too much of our money and you're imposing restrictions on us in the physical world that we have no say in so we are not going to put up with that anymore we are standing up to say that we deserve something better so that is where our country was born and you think about it like that's basically where we are now <laughs> that's basically where a lot of people are right now and i don't even think it matters like which side politically you are you're on on any of the issues like we're all in this place of like ready to stand up for what we believe we deserve now and that is based on what we've lived over the last 246 years of this Pluto cycle. So again, to go a little bit deeper into Pluto as a whole, the archetype. So when we're looking at it in an individual's chart, for example, the evolutionary perspective of Pluto is that this is a wounded place in the psyche we intended to transcend in this lifetime. For Pluto especially, we understand this placement through reincarnation because this definitely gets into who you were in a past life and what was, what was the experience that was so great that it caused you to want to come back and do it again, um, to try to overcome what it was that you experienced last time and have a different experience with what you know now. So... You know, I've said this before, and this comes from Dolores Cannon's work, that Earth is a school. It's a set of lessons. And sometimes when we don't do well on our lessons, when we have a painful experience, we want to come back and we want to try again. Same as when, you know, I mean, why do you think people get addicted to playing video games and the such? Like, you know, they die and they game over a lot. They want to play again because they want to figure out, like, how do I get to the next level? How do I succeed? How do I grow? How do I get better skills? How do I? That's essentially how our soul is, like down to the, the soul level of our being. We just want to get better. We want to learn. We want to improve. So Pluto tells us, like, what was it that drove you back into physical, physical existence? So when we're talking about a country's Pluto return, yeah, we're talking about like what drove this country into existence in the first place. And let's go back and reevaluate the goals and the mission of the people who set out to establish this country. They had a reason. They had a healing that they were trying to create. Pluto return is like, did we accomplish it? Did we heal the way that we thought we were going to? Um, do we still have some work to do? It's an assessment period. Pluto has a lot of different names, and basically this is this is very interesting from, I believe it's Stephen Forrest, I almost said Stephen Tyler, um, from Stephen Forrest's book, he's an evolutionary astrologer, so in the book of Water, where he talks about Pluto and Scorpio, um, basically his bottom line is that hell is part of the human mind and that we can know that because basically every society through history and through space and time they have all come to this conclusion that hell exists and so because humans so universally agree on this it must be inside of us basically so pluto has a lot of names uh, like the lord of the underworld hades god of hell um, and that basically across all definitions, hell is hot, it's underground, and you don't want to go there. So that is essentially where basically anything that's like too hot for our mind to handle, it's too painful, it's too traumatic, it's too overwhelming for our system to process, we put that into hell. We put that into our shadow realm. We put that into our unconscious. We shove it down. If you've ever heard the phrase like bottling your emotions, 
you're shoving those emotions down into a place where they don't just go away. Now they're just in your unconscious, they're in your subconscious, they're haunting your dreams, they're popping into your daydreams, your imagination. You close your eyes, they're giving you visions on the back of your eyeballs. Again, I'm describing this because I've been there. Um, I feel like, again, 15 years of chronic depression, I would say that's as close to hell as you can get. As far as hell, does it exist? Yes, it does. And it's here in this lifetime. It's when you get stuck in negative emotion and you don't know how to get out. That's hell. Um, as soon as you learn how to get out, though, hell kind of evaporates. Again, it goes back to that, like, even in the darkness, there's already a light at the end of the tunnel by the first time, like you even experience the darkness. So it's just realizing like, what is the point of this Pluto energy? And it is, it's a, it's a shaker upper. <laughs> it's a shaker upper. Um, radical transformations, the Phoenix rising from the ashes, where the whole point is that the, the old has to burn to the ground and it's from the ashes of the old that the new is born. Like a butterfly exists because a caterpillar had its whole life and then got this urge to go and spin itself this little cocoon and then it turned to goo and reformed as a butterfly and came out and had a second life as a butterfly. The caterpillar no longer exists. The caterpillar's existence must end for the butterfly to be born and when we're talking about Pluto, we're talking about the phoenix rising from the ashes. We're talking about the caterpillar to butterfly transformation. Pluto as an energy, as an archetype, is where we deconstruct something to the very ground. We take it apart 100% and we scrape out all of the toxic pieces and parts and we destroy Pluto destroys all of the toxic parts that are only standing in the way of our highest good and from there we rebuild once we've turned to goo then we we rebuild we rebuild something that is beautiful we rebuild something that now has a different shape because we've gotten rid of the toxic pieces and parts. They're not part of it anymore. So now we have a different set of pieces to be able to even build what is the new structure, right? So like we took it apart, we got rid of some of the, some of the more toxic, nasty pieces, and now we're going to rebuild something. And it will look different because the pieces that we have to use, it's a different set. So when we think of Pluto being the god of hell and this Pluto return, it's like literally the idea is that we walk through hell and we come out the other side. We go through this transformation. We go through this deconstruction and we let the current systems, the Capricorn systems, we let Pluto do its overhaul and we allow the old systems that aren't working anyway, the toxic parts that aren't working anyway, we allow those to be cleansed. We allow ourselves to grieve them and to let them go and trust that something better is being born in its place. Some other keywords for Pluto. So as far as like these next 18 months and like what ultimately are we gonna see Pluto bringing to the surface? Um, Anytime we're talking about Pluto, we're dealing in the realm of lies, manipulation, deceit, cover-ups, secrets, secrets coming to light, investigations, exposés, exposing power-hungry entities, deepening the understanding of the power and importance of how we choose to show up in the world, meaning like deepening our own sense of our personal power, over trusting and empowering beings and entities and organizations outside of ourselves to have the power. And again, anytime we're in Pluto's realm, we're talking about shadow work. We're talking about hell. We're talking about the things that are in our shadow because they were too painful to process to begin with. That's why they're there. And so, of course, like to talk about bringing things up out of the recesses of our subconscious to bring them out in the light where we can see their ugly faces like <laughs> that's not sunday fun day type processing that's not super fun to do but it's necessary and 
I worry that the less and less we do it willingly, the more the universe will will make it unavoidable for us. You know, like either we can take the medicine or the universe can give it to us. And this this I think is is one of those areas where you know it's important to remember shadow work is never a requirement. Um, even at a time like this, even at a U.S. Pluto return, not a requirement. It's an invitation. It's like there if you want to participate in it. And I'll say it a million times because it's one of my most passionate beliefs is that the point of shadow work is to feel better. So participating, even though it may not sound fun and it may sound painful, the goal is that we feel better in the long run and it is totally possible to get there. So I also just want to touch briefly on Pluto in the second house. So the second house is associated with Taurus, the second sign of the Zodiac, one of the Earth signs. So Pluto in the second house, again, this is very much coming from Stephen Forrest's The Book of Water. Um, Pluto in the second house signifies deep self-doubt, insecurity, and feelings of illegitimacy. And if you, I mean, just stop right there and look back at like, why did they leave Britain to begin with? Like a lot of that, you know, like feeling like you're, you're using us for our tax money and then you're treating us like garbage. So yeah, I don't want to stay in this country and be a peasant. I want to go to a country where I have the option to work hard and keep my own resources to, to work hard and to benefit directly from that hard work. Pluto in the second house also signifies a hyperactive self-protection because in a past life, it signifies that, again, that wound is that these souls were impacted by a nightmarish material lack, poverty, famine, plague, generally a very traumatic lack of physical security. And I mean, I didn't, maybe I lived it, I don't know. I, I don't remember living it um, 246 years ago when they you know, were leaving Britain and making that depart departure. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Um, but I do know that as far as where we are today and where Pluto return is a reevaluation of what we initially set out to do, I think as far as our country population is concerned, there are still way too many people who are without shelter, who are food insecure, and that to me is unacceptable. Pluto in the second house also gives an exaggerated attention to money, physical security, and will compromise the self to acquire that physical security. Um, it also generates an unconscious overconsumption of physical goods. And that part, especially, I was like, US, I see us. I see us being called out in this um, Pluto in the second house business. And the healing. Ultimately, when we're talking about healing any second house placements, this is really what it comes down to. And that is that we need to prove ourselves to ourselves. And that goes for us as a country, but like I said, things don't happen on that collective level, they happen on an individual level. So this is something that we as individuals are proving ourselves to ourselves. We're finding our worth and our security inside of ourselves. This is where, again, this ties directly to the North Node transiting through Taurus right now. That is the very exact definition of what that evolution is all about, is letting go of our attachments to other sources of power and security and finding those inside of ourselves and this u.s pluto return is one of the areas where that skill is basically required right now that is what this energy is asking for is that we are each proving ourselves to ourselves that we we trust ourselves enough to be able to provide security for ourselves and i think still there are there are so many people without security, like actual physical security. And then there's so many people who have physical security who are so afraid of losing it that they are out there fighting with other people, with other people in our country about 
the other people's ways of doing things because they're worried that their ways will eventually encroach and take away their physical security. So I think in general, this Pluto in the second house, like as a country population, we tend to be somewhat selfish, like in a, in a, like we were traumatized in a past life kind of way. Like I'm not trying to be harsh or rude or anything by saying that we as a country are very selfish, but very self-centered and very much worried about our own personal physical security when really it's like like the more we worry about our own personal physical security the more we fight with other people the more overprotective we are of what we have and less likely to share with others it's like that overprotection of ourself is what will be the downfall of our country unless we can transcend that shadow side of Pluto in the second house and being that overprotective so we can, you know, ultimately the healing and proving ourselves to ourselves is like we trust ourselves to provide physical security for ourselves and we trust ourselves so much that we can afford to share and help others because we know that we will be able to figure it out when the chips are down for ourselves. So there's there's some pretty serious upgrades happening here and this is where, you know, to kind of like recap that Pluto return meeting, this is collective trauma coming to the surface to be healed. Ultimately, it's not coming to the surface just to torment us. All these systems aren't breaking down and, you know, falling apart to torment us. This is a time of healing and a potential for overcoming the pain and suffering that has built us to where we are and transmuting that pain and suffering into a new level of awareness, a new level of consciousness, a new level of love and inner security where we can open and relax even greater towards each other because we have such a profound sense of our own internal security and power. And like ultimately, this is the the end of one era and the beginning of a new one. This is the end of the era that began in 1776, 246 years ago, this era started. And next month, February 20th, thereabouts, that era comes to a close and a new era begins. And my favorite part of all of this is like, if we're alive at this time, I believe it's because we meant to be. This is a very exciting time to be alive, to be here for this, like, not only like once in a lifetime transit, but like once every few centuries transit. Um, Most generations of humans don't live to see the Pluto return of their country. So the fact that we're even here right now is an honor and it's a privilege to be one of the humans that's here present to help facilitate this change and help us move forward towards whatever evolution of consciousness we're here to make. Okay, so I've touched on so far, beginning to sort of tie the pieces together. This chapter is Pluto return in Capricorn. So kind of summarizing and tying all the pieces together of what kind of energetic themes are we seeing at this time. First, it is, remember it's exacting there about February 20th through 22nd, but there's still 18 months after that of this energy playing out. Um, The general question that this time is bringing up is, are the systems sustainable and are they strong enough? Do they work for the highest good of all? Does the system align with something that serves the highest good of humanity? And basically bringing to light anything that isn't that and allowing for a deep renovation of the inner workings of the foundation of our country as a whole. Every single placement, Pluto and Capricorn, just as this example, has a whole range of potential. So like looking at the end of the spectrum of potential that looks like failure with this energy, that looks like becoming a slave to the establishment. Someone else wrote the script for your life And basically that at the end of the day, you're exhausted and there's no sweetness in that exhaustion versus if you worked all day long creating your life's work and doing your passion and, 
you know, helping people and doing whatever it is that you feel like you're here to do. When you do that all day and you lay down in bed, your entire body could be aching and it is such a satisfying exhaustion because you know you spent your energy doing something that really mattered. So I think that's how we can begin to kind of practically speaking, find our way into this Pluto return in Capricorn. Like when you go to sleep at the end of the day, how do you feel? How much sweetness is there in your exhaustion at the end of each day? And if there isn't any, that speaks to a revamp of systems that could potentially take place. Um, if there is sweetness at the end of your day, I, I see you as one of the facilitators of like helping others reach that place of finding joy in their day such that every day you go to bed and you're exhausted. Sure, you worked your ass off maybe, but you're totally satisfied because you invested every penny of your own energy into something that matters to your own heart. So, you know, it's not about having an easier time or anything like that. It's like, what are you spending your energy on? And so as an individual, these are questions that like we could be asking ourselves. And when we talk about failure in general around anything and like failure with this energy just means that we continue, you know, the shadow sides of Pluto and Capricorn where we're over trusting of the establishment and authority figures to our own detriment. We are over obligated to our responsibilities and our duties to our own detriment. Um, Capricorn is like a stick with it disciplined person but what happens when that energy is inside of a system that's toxic and broken like should you stick with it or should you let it go should you break free so that's that shadow side of Capricorn where the shadow side of Capricorn is hanging on right like the shadow side of Capricorn is like just doing something so that you're not doing nothing like when we get down to the heart of a fear of failure it's like there's such a reaching and grasping for any sense of am I doing it right am I doing it right and there's a lot of like you know every every moment of our paths is like divinely timed and intended but sometimes like there's a lot of energy to work off in terms of we feel like we need to hurry up and be doing the successful thing or be doing the right thing or be doing our great work and basically because we're impatient and like won't wait for it we just hurry up and do anything just so that we're not doing nothing and there's a little bit in this like taking a step back anytime we go through a return it's that reevaluation process like reassessment like let's take a step back and let's look at what what even was the point of coming here to America and creating these United States and what was the point of all of that? And have we lived up to that? Have we gotten off track? Are we repeating and recreating the mistakes that we were initially trying to get away from? You know, I'll let everybody make their own judgment on that. Um, but yeah, like fear of failure, that's something I think most people can resonate with, like whether it's something that's huge and, you know, comes up in your life a lot or just happens every once in a great while. I think we all are familiar with that sensation of I don't want to do it wrong. I don't I don't want to be responsible for for us getting it wrong. I don't want to make a mistake. And there like as a culture, we we are kind of taught that making mistakes is like not really a great thing. It's a pretty bad thing. It has a pretty big net negative connotation around making mistakes. It's not a glamorous situation. Um, and yet the fear of making mistakes paralyzes us and keeps us stuck in what is. And again, I go back to what if what is is toxic and corrupt and not serving the highest good of all. You know, do you stay or do you go? And I think like one example of this as far as like what what does this look like as far as past life experiences basically like in a past life you're so defined by duty that it damaged you found we found our virtue through handling our responsibilities even when they were toxic 
basically like imagine a scenario where you died for your country in a war you didn't believe in like you gave your life that's like the most we can give right um, you sacrificed your life for a cause that you did not believe in because that was your duty that was your responsibility that's what you needed to do and so those are the kinds of things where it's like maybe maybe in a past life it's not like you did anything wrong or like anybody even really did anything wrong to you it's just you made your choices and eventually you figure out like oh oh maybe I shouldn't go along with what the authority figure says just because they're the authority figure maybe I shouldn't trust somebody just because they're my authority maybe I should be vetting them a little bit more maybe my opinion matters a little bit more than I previously let it I previously like didn't act according to my own opinion I went with what my authority figure said was right and what was wrong and I lived like that and maybe I gave my life for that kind of a situation and now coming back as far as like what we're here to create with this whole Pluto return we're here to ask ourselves like what what do you think as far as the balance of power in your experience you know are you enjoying how empowered you are do you enjoy the level of power that you feel in your own experience or do you feel like others are holding the power and if so how good of a job do you think they're doing and these are honest questions these aren't meant to be inflammatory questions and i think you know when we're in touch with our emotions and we're in a good rhythm of shadow work and understanding these negative emotions and that they're messages that are here to help us, there's really no reason to like get super mad and crazy anger. I mean, there's anger, there's anger present. Absolutely, there's anger present. And that's one of the emotions that we're gonna get into. But there's, there's something more under the anger, right? Like that's, that's what Tara Brock teaches with her RAIN technique. Um, RAIN stands for recognize, investigate, allow, and nurture. So it's an emotional awareness technique to let you be with your emotion and get the message out of it. RAIN and emotional awareness and emotion management in general, it doesn't stop the negative emotion, but it does let you be with it in a constructive way where it can communicate with you what it has to sh- what it has to share with you so for example that anger that maybe we feel at some of the ways that things are being handled in our country that's okay that's absolutely normal and I have anger as well and that's that's normal but there's a lot of people who get stuck there and who just they're acting out their anger and they're fighting with the other side and What Rain lets you do and what Tara Brock teaches on her channel and in her videos is about like being with that anger and going deeper into it to say like, where is this anger really coming from? Like my judgment of the other side, where is it really coming from? And underneath anger, like let's say it's a political divide and you're angry at the other side. Again, it doesn't matter what side you're on because everybody basically feels the same opposition with the other side. And in that experience, we're actually all standing on the same common ground. So yeah, like when you're angry at the other side, what's underneath that? Like we don't need to charge into battle because, oh, here we are, we're mad. Why don't we just stay put for just a second? and stay within ourselves and contain our anger within ourselves because really at the end of the day, it's ours. And let's let's sit with it and go deeper into it. And generally speaking, underneath that anger at the other side is this fear about what the other side represents. And again, we're still standing on common common ground as far as human nature and human experience what regardless of what side you're on typically when you've picked your side for whatever reason at today's day and age like we almost like demonize that other side because they stand for values and ideas and 
practices and methods that we don't agree with. And in that disagreement, we think not just that they are bad or that those views are problematic, but that the person themselves is bad, that the whole side is bad, and that now it's our job to fight against it. And again, I love that like no matter which side you're on, we're all have we're all basically having the same shared experience. So what does this look like, like in a practical sense? Um, really, like we're waking up to the limitations of living to work. And one example, there are many. One example of this is the concept of retirement. And I don't mean to be dark, but it does paint a perfect picture of this. Basically, you know, my dad is a good example of someone who has adopted the belief that he's never going to retire because when you retire, you die because he has had multiple people from his either industry circles, from his work or his like personal friends who have like worked their asses off the way he does. He hard worker and they work and work and work until it's finally time for them to be allowed to retire and they retire and then they have a heart attack like right away. I mean, that has happened in his circle over and over and over. And that's what I'm talking about. Like to live, to work, to say, you know, I only have 10 more years till I can retire. I only have five more years until I can retire. I only have 20 years until, I mean, whatever it is, if you're working towards this future date and time where then you are allowed to live the life that you ultimately want to live that sense of retirement that exists on the horizon like you just never get there and that's what my dad i mean he's had to see this like play out in his physical experience over and over again to the point where now he realizes like cold turkey retirement isn't really a thing like that's not a thing if you want peace if you want a peaceful existence like that's like a throttle that exists inside of you already And so like, he's a perfect example of like, he has naturally like over the last five to 10 years, he's just slowed down. Like he doesn't plan to retire. So he's adjusting his work pace to what's enjoyable considering he plans to do it for the rest of his life. And I've learned a lot from watching him go through that, honestly, because how I take it is I know most people would say I'm maybe like 32 to 35 years away from being able to retire, but I don't want to retire. I don't, I don't intend to retire ever. Um, and in that same way, I would say I'm already retired. Like I'm building a lifestyle for myself that I plan to do for the rest of my days on this physical plane. Like my work is me living out my soul's purpose. So why would I ever want to retire from that? if you're if you're doing your soul's work there will be no retirement you'll you'll look forward to working until your last breath like you'll just do it because it's who you are it's intertwined with your very identity your soul's identity so if you're living from that place that is a lifelong process that can start right now so again going back to when you lay down at the end of the day how does it feel And if that's an uncomfortable question, I really don't mean to like be putting it back in your face over and over again, but it is such a good indicator, just like the gas gauge in your car. When it shows that your, your gas tank is almost empty. Don't you like to know that? Don't you like to know that like, Hey, I should probably go to the gas station soon and like top off so that I don't get stranded somewhere that I don't want to be like, this is kind of like that. Like, If you're dissatisfied at the end of your day regularly, I mean, this is a season, both the North Node through Taurus and Pluto returning Capricorn, both of these energies are calling for us to realize how powerful it is that like we are responsible for how we show up in this world. And if we are choosing to show up to a life that like leaves us feeling drained and not satisfied at the end of every day, why are you doing that? You know, what's the point? If the point is some benefit that is going to pay off 20 years from now, I would really urge you to rethink your strategy because that is a really privileged point of view that a 
just assumes that life will still be here in 20 years, you know, that like our country will still be here, that the option will still be there. Like basically learning to live in the now is what we're being asked to do. So like at this point, especially in America and pr probably other capitalist areas as well, there are these things called hustle culture and grinding and just hustling in general. And these are like millennial era versions of the same, the same ideology that just says like, work hard and save your money and build a retirement account. And when you're 65, 70 years old, then you can enjoy your life. And hustle culture where you know you can sleep when you're dead like sleep is for lazy people like you hear all of these things out there as far as we should be going at warp speed to build something build what doesn't matter as long as you're going at warp speed as long as you're hustling like it'll all come together so just work hard just work all the time don't stop keep going but wait what am i trying to create doesn't matter just keep going like Oh my goodness. No, this is the time to let's just let's just take a breath. Let's just ease up on the hustle for just a second and reevaluate what is it that you're even trying to create. So basically like the consequences of glamorizing overworking are coming to light and again practically what that means are people that you thought were really rich and had like this luxurious lifestyle going on it's like you know they're their dirty laundry coming out as far as they're actually broke and they're getting their house repossessed and they are now renting and like on and on and on like basically the bubbles the bubbles are bursting like people who have been putting on this you know, I'm rich, therefore my life is perfect facade, more and more and more people are being clued into the fact that that is a complete delusion and money and happiness are not correlated like hardly at all, maybe not even at all. So money is absolutely not the source of happiness. And there's a very real reason that there's an old saying saying money is the source of greed. Money is like the source of all evil. Like money itself is not bad, but when you get into a physical resources conversation, our survival brain kicks in and says there's only so many pieces of the pie. And if I'm going to survive, I need to get in there, throw some elbows and get my piece. And look at like immediately you're set up into a comp competition type environment with your fellow like community members, family members, country members, like that's, that feels like what's, what's ultimately missing in our country at this point is seeing everyone here, like as an extension of yourself, which is actually really good to like help liberate us from the distorting grip of that reality, like Instagram models and <laughs> Photoshop people and on and on like there's this um, channel that I've been watching lately where she she does a lot of side-by-side -side comparisons of Photoshop versus reality and it's like we can't there's so many things in this world that we just trust by default and like I said we were going to come back to trust and this is a time of a lot of people being disillusioned and waking up to maybe our trust was in the wrong place. We put our trust in the wrong ideas, in the wrong people. And that right there is a moment of shadow work, you know, when you realize that you made a bad call, when you, you know, look back at what you did and realize like, man, I should have done that differently or knowing what I know now, I would have made a different choice. That's a hard moment. That's a moment of self-compassion that's a moment of kindness that's a moment of like remembering to treat yourself like someone that you love <sighs> a moment of like coming back over and over and over again to those mantras of well-being is dominant everything is always working out for me so if this is what happened this is what was supposed to happen if this is what happened, this is what I was supposed to learn from in this moment. And 
I will be a different person because I went through this experience and because I learned this lesson. I'm now a different person. And maybe my soul's path, my soul's journey was going to take me into territory where I needed to be this person in order to be successful. The universe provides the tools that we need. So trusting in divine timing is one of the ways that I would suggest if you're looking for ways to like reallocate your trust away from these like physical authority type structures um, trusting in divine timing trusting in the well-being of this universe trusting in the inherent goodness of your own soul that's a big one that's a really big one like I stop here because I am working with this concept like as we speak. <laughs> I mean, this is what a big topic that was in my journal this morning was like even just making this video, I feel such a responsibility to do it, do it right. Um, and so it's been such a journey through my own contemplation of like, what does that even mean to like do this video right? What does that mean to me? And throughout this experience, and like I said, up until this morning, there was something brewing under the surface that I didn't quite know what it was. And this morning I had yet another emotional release, AKA crying, um, AKA transmuting emotional energy through tears, converting it to tears um, and releasing it through that water. Um, crying is extremely healthy that's what I'm getting at um and so yeah I had a whole moment of realization this morning of I was almost like paralyzed by this fear that I wasn't going to get it right and I think ultimately that was time well spent because I really did reach deeper clarity around what does right even mean to me but this morning underneath that fear like using Tara Brock's RAIN method, underneath my fear was this self-doubt in myself that like maybe I'm bad, like maybe I'm bad and that's why like I'll make a mistake or I won't get it right or I'll do more harm than good. Like there was this underlying self-doubt that as I, as I went under the fear of like this video and getting this video right, there was like this deeper sense of what if I'm not good? What if, what if I'm bad? You know, do you ever worry if you're bad? I think we all do. I think that's like a universal human condition that's like a byproduct of our culture. And that's one of the systems, that's one of the systemic pieces of our culture that I'll be excited to see transformed because we each are inherently good. Well-being is dominant at the core of this universe. And that is one of the main themes that I see in this new earth, in this new, you know, in this rebirth of our identity, this US Pluto return, like the death of the old, the birth of the new, like what is the new? I see it as this unconditional love of all beings, this this understanding that anyone who is alive is inherently worthy so one little exercise that i would recommend um, and i've shared it on my channel before because i feel like this is one of the pillars of what owning authenticity means to me in the first place and that is personalizing your definition of success so especially when we look at hustle culture and grinding and capitalism in general a little bit um, success is something that we're indoctrinated with when we're small to mean getting all A's and looking good on paper essentially so I think the first step to doing that to personalizing your definition of success is to recognize what is your current definition of success like what is the conditioned version of success that you have grown up with that you've been operating with so far so recognize what shape that takes in you right now and from there it's it's a deeper process of reflection but ultimately like in some kind of journaling or um, whatever kind of reflection process you enjoy 
like to take that question of what does success really mean? Like, what does success feel like? What does it look like? You know, there's, there was a good chunk of my career in my 20s where success to me was a lot wrapped up in how big my salary was and how often I was getting promoted and those kinds of things. And I was living a life where I was working like 70, 80 hours a week and I was miserable and I was in a burnout, like go back and work really hard and then burn out and then go back and work really hard and then burn out and then go. I was in like this cycle that was like totally not healthy for me. And I lived there for like a good long while and I had to, I think I had to like chase that definition of success so that I could learn that that's not it. You know, like making a lot of money isn't isn't correlated with happiness, like I said. So getting promoted at work, yeah, that's exciting for like a day and then you just work harder <laughs> and on harder stuff and all of that. So yeah, it's it's like reorienting the very idea of like what is the point of what I'm doing? What does success look like? What are those metrics that let me know I've hit my target? What is my target? Like when you start thinking about like what is your personal definition of success? There's a lot of ground to cover there. So again, this is an 18-month process. This is not something where you need to have all this figured out today. But these are things to be thinking about and to bring your idea of success inside of yourself as much as you can. I would also recommend as much as you can to keep it like an emotional definition of success, something that is completely independent from external circumstances. Like my version of success is when I feel easy and peaceful on the inside, when I feel open to my higher self that's when I feel like I'm being successful. So at that point, I can achieve success simply by how I'm tuning my inner world. And that's something I have 100% full-time control over, as does every, every one of us. So that means that I can be successful no matter what. It's 100% up to me. It's 100% within my control whether or not I'm successful. When we define our success in those external terms of like, you know, when I'm promoted, then I'll be successful. Well, then when they promote the jackass next to you who like mostly kisses ass and doesn't do any work, when they promote him instead of you, you're pretty pissed off. You are mad now because you can't reach success because this guy who doesn't deserve it just got your promotion. You're back in that physical scenario where we are back in that mindset of there's only so many pieces of the pie. And if he got one, that's because that's, I didn't, he took my piece of the pie and now I'm mad at him to get through this time. It'll be a matter of tuning inward and realizing that the pie is infinite and you can have as much as you allow yourself to have because it's an internal process of granting ourselves peace and success. So putting it in a definition and into a context where it's something that you can tune into inside of yourself. Personally, I think that's how you're going to set yourself up for success in the greatest degree. Um, ultimately, you guys all get to do whatever works for you because as I put on the screen all the time, I am not a trained professional. So ultimately, I think this Pluto return in Capricorn bottles down to, boils down to becoming our own leader. And this is again where I want to stop and do some shadow work on this piece because basically we're, we're being called into this situation. And again, I don't think it matters what side you're on. I don't think anybody's very happy right now um, with how things are being handled in our country. But basically we're being asked to consider like can the establishment influencers authority figures whoever that is the these authorities outside of ourselves who are holding the power can they be trusted enough to be relied on that's the question you know like the government and the authority and whoever it is that's outside of you that you think is holding your power like they have power because you gave it to them they have power because we buy in so if 
if we decide that we don't trust them enough to give them our power, then they cease to have power. So this whole U.S. Pluto return, this rebirth of the country's identity, again, it is extremely in the hands of the individual people to get to decide, like, what is what is it that you want? What does success look like to you? What would a secure living situation look like to you? How do you factor in the well-being of our country as a whole? So can these external authority figures be trusted or not? And we get to decide that for ourselves. Like it's a personal question that each of us will get to conclude whatever feels right to us. But at the end of the day, like right now, a lot of us live in this mode of living up to societal standards and doing what it is that we think we're supposed to be doing. So again, if you decide that this external authority isn't trustworthy and you reallocate your power to yourself, that guides your entire life path as far as how you choose to show up in the world because you no longer are living within the confines of having to live up to what society expects of you if you pull your trust and your faith out of the governing powers of that society. So there's great opportunity here for all of us as individuals to basically like walk our own talk to like grab a hold of our own moral steering wheel. Like there's a lot of people right now, again, I think it's like on all sides of like all parties, everyone's just mad at the government. Um, it's really easy to be mad at the government and to say that they have failed. I'll tell you what's hard is to take your power and put it back inside of yourself, to stop relying on the government to provide for you and to be your own leader. That's scary. That's really scary. It's way easier to just get mad at the government and blame them for whatever it is that you think they're not doing right. The real growth comes when we face our fears and put that power back inside of ourselves. And I think this is where, again, we step into a really big bubble of shadow work because in order to in order to be your own leader, there's like some pre prerequisites to that, that like, I love the concept of becoming your own leader, but for real, in order to follow your own lead, I would say you need to trust yourself. You need to trust that like you're a good person. You need to, tr uh, you need to like yourself, which sounds like a no brainer, but I don't know how many people out there really like themselves. Um, and you need to respect yourself. And again, I think those areas, I'm going off my own personal experience. Like I still work actively in my own personal shadow work on these things, on appreciating myself and accepting myself and which is to say liking myself, um, trusting my own goodness. Like I said, I was journaling about that this morning. <laughs> so becoming our own leader is absolutely terrifying. And this is where I think it's really interesting to look back at the very first democracy was in 500 BC in Athens, Greece. And it was a little bit different than the kind of democracy that we have today where we all get to vote. And so we elect people to represent us in the government. We all have represent equal representation and whatnot. Um, back in the original democracy, every adult participated in the government. So it wasn't that you went out to vote once every year, or two years or four years or whatever, or never, you know, lots of people in this country don't even exercise that, right? Um, so it wasn't just that you like went and filled out a bubble sheet, you participated regularly in the discussions, in the, the choosing of how to run the country and the government. And the truth is, again, the easy way out, the cop out is to get mad at the government at the job that they're doing the way harder path is to take our power put it back inside of ourselves which is to say take responsibility of doing something about it do something about it if you don't like it do something about it there's so much anger and so much fighting that doesn't do anything about it it's it's like venting it's like just rolling around in it like in the mess of it just flopping and flailing around and it's like yeah i mean but at some point like we kind of got to just stand up 
put our rubber gloves on, like crank the music and clean up the mess. Like sometimes you have to just buckle down and do the gross thing that you don't want to do or do the hard thing that you don't want to do. Step up and take responsibility for fixing it. And that's something that, again, like we as individuals are in the process of essentially like taking responsibility for our own individual lives. And I think, you know, when you have a population of people, let's say like, you know, fast forward through the end of this Pluto return, when you have a population of people who have taken their power and allocated it to themselves, they're owning their power now, the government that that governs those people looks very different. Like government as a function is administrative, okay? So like taxes and infrastructure and roads and, and you know, all kinds of things that defense, that's a really controversial one. Um, but anywho, we won't get sidetracked there. Like there's a lot of like administrative services that it's really convenient that the government provides those centralized services to the people as a whole. So there's room for government, but the whole idea of Pluto return for a country is that the government is not under any obligation to look like what it's looked like so far. I do want to take us through like, what does it mean that the system is crumbling? Like, what are we really talking about? Again, we go back when we have a return, we go back to the birth of the country as a whole. Where did it come from? Why is it here? And I think we can learn a lot by looking at the Declaration of Independence itself, which is what we are considering the birth of this country. Um, So this is just like one food for thought. I have a lot of examples um, around kind of this initiation of our country and why maybe it's not such a bad thing that we take a second and reevaluate if we don't want to make some changes. But we'll we'll use this one thing as an example. So I'm going to read from the Declaration of Independence itself. Had to look this up. Oh, July 4th, 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that where whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Couple of things with this. Um, one, it's like right there in the in the initial document that we signed to start this country, that if the government's not doing their job, the people have the right to reform it, which, you know, that's like a much larger conversation as far as like practically speaking, what would that look like? But let's just like put a pin in that over here to the side real quick. And let's just jump back up to that very first line that says, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, which is another word for freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's just like a little warm and fuzzy line. It feels real good. Thomas Jefferson, good for him, originally wrote those words of all men are created equal. And here's a like a WTF moment, if I ever did hear of one is that not only did Thomas Jefferson own slaves at the time of writing those words, slavery in the United States was legal until 1865. So what's that? 89 years of the initial formation and existence of our country. That's like a third, a third of our life, slavery, the ownership of other human beings was legal. Our founding fathers participated in this practice 
of owning other humans, meanwhile signing their names to a document that says all men are created equal. Like, I don't even necessarily think we, we had the wrong intention to begin with. I think we had the right intention, but I don't think we meant what we said. You know, the guy who wrote those words clearly did not mean that all men are created equal. It took until the 13th Amendment for slavery to be abolished in the United States. And even then, it took several more months for Union soldiers to actually go physically and free the last of the slaves. That happened June 19th, 1865. That's where we get the holiday Juneteenth, which I think is so fascinating not to like steal thunder out of this moment, but June 19th is my birthday. I was like, whoa, crazy. So 1865 was the end of slavery in this country. And yet, so that was 156 years ago. And yet we still had segregation up until the 1900s. We, we still have in like 2020, 2021, 2022, like right now, we still have racial stereotypes that run rampant in this country, that people see someone's race and they think they know who they are as a person. I mean, blatant racism still exists in this country. And when we talk about systemic racism, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a constitution of the United States that allowed for slavery and wasn't amended for 89 years to abolish it. And we still use that constitution. And like, imagine even after the slaves were freed, they weren't allowed to vote. That didn't come until way later. That was a different amendment to the Constitution. So just because they were free, they still didn't get equal rights. That took way later. So I look at all of this as this is where we started. This was where our country was born. I also want to add that, you know, the U.S., abolished slavery in 1865 and in Britain where they came from slavery was basically over by about 1800 so only 25 years before that was when they signed the Declaration of Independence so I personally got to thinking and was just very curious like was that part of why they left Britain also like I know it's really easy to tell a story about taxation and representation, but were they feeling this pressure, this growing pressure of like Britain realizing that they didn't want slavery to be allowed in their country anymore. They wanted to free these people and they would get paid like everybody else. So I did wonder like, was that part of why they left in the first place? Because the timeline would kind of suggest that it is like they came over here with their slaves and they proceeded to keep them slaves for, you know, a solid 65 years after they would have had to let go of their slaves if they had stayed where they were. So they had like a whole nother couple generations of people come through the U.S. in inside of this slave structure in terms of both the slaves and the slave owners and just further cemented the roots of this country inside that structure where all men are not created equal. That was an illusion back then, and it's barely less than that now. And so, again, I don't think that we had the wrong intention to start with, but I do think it's worthwhile to go back and be like, how can we start again and actually mean it this time, <laughs> you know? Or is there just a better document altogether that we could just, like, wipe the, wipe the slate clean and, you know, like, let's actually be in this, like, for equality and fairness this time. And honestly, you got to stop right there. And two, like, no matter your race as an American, whether you're coming through more of a slave identity, the disempowered side of it, or you're coming through a white path where it's like the guilt and shame of Ha like basically being descendants most likely of people who were slave owners and even if we personally aren't their descendants eight out of the first 12 presidents were slave owners so again no matter which side of this you're on there is significant shadow work to be done around slavery in general and the way that we've treated people of other races um 
this is where again I go back to saying like this is not the only example like Native Americans is another place where as a person who has Native American blood in me I I feel like that's just too big of a subject to even get into right now but so much shadow work around the guilt and the shame and the embarrassment and the anger around how our ancestors behaved like there's so much tradition and respect for our founding fathers and our ancestors and those who came before and I'm the first to get in line behind like you know our ancestors like our spiritual ancestors that have passed over like they protect us and they're they're our spiritual support and like all of that but at the same time I think you know, even though our ancestors are long gone, like our founding fathers in this case are long gone, I still think it's important that we go back through and hold them accountable for who they were and the roots, the seeds that turned into the roots of this country that they planted. They started off a racist country. They set us up in that kind of a situation and we are still living out the ripple effects of that. And I, you know, you see a lot of different sides of it when you really look and like take it all in. There's, there's obviously been a lot of progress, but at the same time, like, I don't know if it's as significant as we'd like to think versus the hatred is more underground now than it used to be allowed for it to be out in the open. I think there's room to hold our founding fathers accountable and to acknowledge that it's possible to be grateful to them for starting this country and for you know creating this path into existence that we've all you know if you're a u.s resident like we've all walked on this path that they made but i think it's still possible to go back and re-examine who they were as people and the ideals that our country was born from i don't think any of that should be immune just because it's part of our history and we don't want to mess with it yada 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 it's like that is an excuse to prevent change in the present the more we can go back and learn from our past the less likely we are to repeat those mistakes in the present and i think you know there have been enough like public examples george floyd is probably the most public where the level of contempt and like like flat out hatred that still exists on the basis of the color of someone's skin is like truly it's honestly just sad like i i've had a couple major emotional releases around this as far as it's just so sad how many people are still harboring hate towards either towards someone because of the color of their skin or towards the world because of how their ancestors were treated like i think there's there's anger on all sides that is it's notifying us of healing that's there it's inviting us into healing that's there but as far as like going deeper than just the anger and realizing like what is it that we really want like what is it that even like where is this anger coming from in the first place and that is a personal journey for each of us that's something that you know but like to go through these emotions um and like understand what's the message like shame is a perfect example like if we feel shame over how our ancestors behaved like like i literally feel shame at knowing that eight of the first 12 presidents were slave owners george washington included like owned slaves, profited from slave labor. It's literally disgusting to me to think about that. And I do feel ashamed that these are, these are the foundations of our country. And yet you can't change that. So like, what do you do with the shame? Well, you understand like, where is it coming from? It's coming from a place of really disagreeing with that behavior. It's coming from a place of believing that human beings deserve better than that and it's coming from a place of worrying that i won't be big enough to change it 
it's like I'm worrying that I'll be a part of a generation of people who are only continuing to exacerbate the same problems. I don't know if I said that word right. I think you know what I mean, though. Like, I don't want to I don't want to do it wrong. I don't want to mess it up. I don't want to make it worse by my contribution. You know, like there's so much pain out there already and I don't want to rub salt in the wound. I want to hopefully apply healing medicine to the wounds. And I think, you know, part of processing the shadow work that this Pluto return is asking for is taking a good, honest look at our roots and our history and getting really honest and clear around what is it that you ultimately think about how this country was founded and how does that inform where we go from here? I want to leave us with just a few thoughts that kind of popped up throughout. Um, the first one is going back to that idea of becoming our own leader and the process of self-love and self-acceptance that goes along with building up your own trust in yourself enough to be able to follow your own lead. So go back to that North Node in Taurus video as far as, again, that North Node through Taurus is really helping to build us up to be capable of doing exactly that. You know, this is the end of that era where we're living to work and our sense of like the life that we want to live is off in the future. Like when I retire, then I'll travel or once I retire, then I'll do this passion project. And this time is about taking those things that are most important that you really want to do and working them into your right now moment, because right now is really all we ever have. The future is not guaranteed. And if anything, we are living in times of immense change. So also to say, you know, the light side of that situation is this is a good excuse and a great time to practice deep appreciation and gratitude for every single little luxury in your life, every single convenience. And before you tell me that you're not living a luxurious lifestyle, I have a few suggestions of some things that we could we could resonate and appreciate um, your toothbrush like having a toothbrush, getting to brush your teeth on a regular basis. That's pretty nice. Um, like most of us have clean drinking water here in the U.S. Like there's a few exceptions, obviously, that have come out over the last like decade and a half. Thank you, Pluto and Capricorn, for bringing those things to the surface. So we know they're going on. Um, but most of us have clean drinking water. Like you go to your faucet and you turn it on and you can have as many cups of water as you want. Like I was watching Battlestar Galactica the other day and they like blew a hole in the side of their water tanker and they were venting like all their water, 60% of their water got vented into space. And so they went on an immediate water lockdown. And that meant that like no showers, no washing your hands, no flushing the toilets, no like no doing anything with the water that isn't drinking it to survive. That's it. That's all we're doing with the water now. And that says like you can only drink this much per day. So like they went into water rations where you don't get to turn it on yourself. You get handed this little bit of water and that's all you get. And like we don't even come close to living in that kind of scenario. Like not only can I turn on my water tap and like drink as many cups as I want. I the water bill is so cheap. Like, I don't know how much your guys' water is, but I feel like water should be more expensive and maybe we would be serving it better. I don't know. That's just me. Water's really cheap. Um, and you can have as much as you want. Uh, hot water. What a concept. What a freaking concept to like anytime you want, just like go in your bathroom and take a hot shower. You know, like, whoa, in-home laundry to where you don't have to transport your clothes anywhere. You can just like, you know, push them in the laundry room and wash them up. That's pretty nice. Um, if you possess a car of any kind, that's a very huge luxury. Our beds, our pillows, our shampoo. Oh my gosh, that you can just like open the bottle and like open the little cap and just droop, put a little like glob on your paw and like wash your hair and then your hair is clean. Like these are luxuries my friends, and the fact that we take them for granted on a daily basis, it's a reflection of our own privilege. And that's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow, but I do give it to you to maybe invite you to swallow it because there is a rich 
opportunity in front of us right now to like basically take advantage of whatever time we have left in this era you know like we're in a stage of rebirth the old is ending the new is beginning like there there will be a lot of things that don't make it from right now into the next version of whatever it is that's being reborn so if there's things that you want to do places you want to go experiences you want to have have them now and enjoy them soak them up any little luxury that you're exposing yourself to clean clothes dryer sheets clean water limitless hot water for your shower like on and on and on be grateful for those experiences and those little amenities because we're not guaranteed those luxuries those are not those are not a guaranteed right of existence those are things that we live in a very advanced society and most of us have access to those things and so we take it for granted that it's just normal and if we lost it we'd be really sad so, you know, I'm not saying that we're going to lose anything. I'm just saying that if we did lose it, you'd probably be grateful that you spent the last little bit of time being really grateful and soaking it up and like being really present to how amazing it is to have that luxury in your life. Remember that point of reflection as far as like internalizing and personalizing your definition of success, going through like, how do I know when I've hit the mark? What are the metrics for letting me know when I've hit the mark? And really to answer that question, you have to also answer what is the mark? What is even the point of what I'm wanting to create? And that's a very personal question. That's an individual question that we're each getting to answer for ourselves right now. And with that, we are freeing our energy from conventional fruitless paths about what is right and wrong. So a lot of us are freeing ourselves from letting society dictate what is right and what is wrong, what is life supposed to look like, what's, you know, what's a successful life, Let, letting go of that and instead crafting our own definition, crafting our own lifestyle that speaks to our authentic selves and us following our unique energy flow, that we're finding our way into that rhythm for ourselves. And again, the government that's needed to govern a body of people like that is very different from the government we have today. Again, because we are the ones giving it power. So if we reallocate power, the government will naturally evolve. I've mentioned a couple times in some videos about focus wheels, and it's this idea that at the center of the wheel you put an idea or a concept, something that you're wanting to build momentum on, and then around the spokes of the wheel, so all around the center, you describe what is that thing. And so I've done myself, and I'm inviting you to do some as well, some focus wheels on the new earth. What does the new earth look like? So if you took the very center of that focus wheel and filled it with the new earth and then all around that new earth idea, what does that look like? And I shared a few ideas that I've felt into as far as unconditional love and equality between all of us that like if you're here, you're inherently worthy of belonging and love. And as far as you making those focus wheels and like coming up with your own ideas of what does the new earth look like to you? What does the new version, like all of this deconstruction that's happening as far as like the toxicity of our systems is being scraped out so that we can put something back together that is more authentic and is a, a truer version of something that's gonna serve the highest good. What does that new earth process, what does that look like? What, what are the themes, the emotional themes of the new earth that you can feel? Tell me in the comments, I would love to hear. And last but not least, Pluto is headed into Aquarius after it is done in Capricorn. And that happens through a little bit of a two-step process. So in 2023, March to June, Pluto will enter Aquarius and will stay at zero degrees while it slows down to station retrograde. And then it does go retrograde. And June 11th, 2023, it goes back into Capricorn and it goes back into Capricorn and then it stations direct and it goes through those last degree, couple degree points of Capricorn again from June 11th of 2023 until January 21st of 2024 when Pluto officially moves into Aquarius and is there until 2044. So we'll have 20 years of Pluto going through Aquarius and it's said that like 
same the same thing is kind of going on between Pluto and Capricorn and Uranus and Taurus so it's said that like while these planets are in these earth signs we're experiencing the deconstruction of the current physical plane we're being shown where all the flaws are where our systems are toxic etc and all the lies and deceit and cover-ups and all of that is coming to the surface so we can heal it and once these two planets pluto and uranus move out of the earth signs into pluto's going to aquarius uranus will go from taurus to gemini once they move into the air signs that's said to be like the new beginning the building of whatever's coming next so that's why i say like as far as the physical plane changing we do still have a couple years of these changes and the things that need to change being brought to light um and so to that end, I will be recording next my second video, which will take us through, like I said, the, the roots of why did we have the 2008 financial crisis. I'm not an economist, but I do have a bachelor's and a master's in microeconomics. I never got a job using my economics training, but I sure do like to study it from afar. And I will be using those skills to hopefully tell what I, like I said, I think this is one of the best stories of all time is like, what the hell happened with this housing bubble? It's insane how the pieces came together. Um, it was very much a problem of our own making as humans, like going back to the, you made your bed, now lay in it. Like you set this up, human beings built this system and its toxicity overran it to the point where we caused a global financial crisis. So that is what the next video will be about. Again, to the ends of, we are very much in the phase of coming face to face with what is it about our current system that is toxic? What is it that does need to be faced and processed through that shadow workspace so that it can be transmuted and healed? What is it that's wrong with the way our country is? And again, I'm not asking for a fight. I'm asking for a coherent discussion around like, what is it? What is it that is needing to be brought through that shadow workspace? Not blaming other people for all the ways that they're doing it wrong, but what are your emotions? What are, what are your guilts? What are your fears? What are your shames and embarrassments what are those and how are they sitting with you right now and you know what sometimes like the best we can do is just to cry at how how powerless we really are like when i did that math on like 1865 i basically was like 2022 minus 1865 is like 156 years ago and I just like broke down crying with like, how does racism still exist? How does this still exist in our country? How are there still people who hate other people based on the color of their skin? Why? Like it just, oh, it makes me so mad. All I could do was cry. And I did. I sat there and I just, I cried for several minutes. And I feel like I let, I let that shame and that embarrassment and that just i mean overall anger at the the ways of the past i let it wash through me and i let myself feel it i let myself feel the injustice of it and feel the sadness of it and to a certain degree i feel like i let myself through that through that emotional release i let myself clear that a little bit more not only from my vibration, but from the collective energies. I mean, anytime we heal ourselves, those healing ripple effects move through the entire collectives. Thank you so much for your energy in this topic. For real, even listening to this kind of material, I know takes, takes energy and presence on your part. And I, I sincerely appreciate you on behalf of the collective for doing any of these shadow work processes that we're talking about that those healing ripple effects really do affect us all. So thank you for that. 
if you do find value here, I do ask if you leave me a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Those little boosts really do help push my content through the YouTube algorithm, which I do appreciate. I'll be coming out here in about a month or so, I would say, with a comment reaction video on this one. So if you do have thoughts, questions, comments of any kind, leave them down below and I will get back to you in a future video as far as continuing to explore this space of this Pluto return in Capricorn for the US and really for humanity as a collective. We are all going through this transformation. Until next time, dear friends, I hope you take such good care of yourselves and so will I.